Good. Thank you all for coming. It's always good to come up to Seattle to the Discovery Institute to see old friends. I'm sorry that Bruce Chapman couldn't be here, who is the head of the Discovery Institute. Uh, I dedicated A Rat as a Pig as a Dog as a Boy to Bruce, and I'd like to read you uh, that dedication. Uh, and I did so because of his tremendous support he has given me over these years uh, through uh, good times and bad in, with regard to this project and my other work. To Bruce Chapman, in deep appreciation of his leadership, personal support, and abiding friendship. Uh, I think all people who were involved with the Discovery Institute would agree with me uh, that Bruce is really a sterling leader and, and a, he's uh, uh, indefatigable in his support and his promotion of the work of the various fellows and the various things Discovery does. I'm also really proud to be associated with Discovery. I, I'm not involved in, uh, for example, the intelligent design issue, but I certainly notice the uh, sturm and drang, if you will, the uh, yelling and screaming about it. And uh, the thing that I've noticed is that uh, people who work in that field here at Discovery are maligned more than they're engaged. And I find that very telling, and I think it's very disturbing. And so I, uh, I just want to, uh, what is it, uh, Sarah Palin says, a shout out? Uh, that's, um, uh, I think, younger than my generation. But uh, I want to just associate myself with the Discovery Institute because the people here, whether one agrees with them or doesn't, they have integrity, they have intelligence, and they have commitment. So uh, that being said, let's get on to the animal rights movement. How did I get involved in this issue of animal rights? It certainly wasn't something I planned, uh, but one day I was out at a high school and I was speaking to an honors high school class. And I was talking about the importance of universal human equality, the importance of human exceptionalism, that is, the intrinsic value of human life. And I was speaking in terms of bioethics. There's a bioethicist, probably the most famous, and I'm afraid, uh, for reasons that will be made clear in a few minutes, most influential thinker of our times, Peter Singer, who is now at Princeton. And Peter Singer is well known for supporting infanticide. The idea that if a baby is born that doesn't suit the interests of the family, it should be acceptable to kill that child based on the idea not that the child is disabled, he often uses disabled babies as the illustration, but that the child is not a person. Uh, and Peter Singer defines a person as being an, an individual that has certain cognitive capacities. I won't go into all those details here. Um, and Peter Singer believes that some human beings are not persons and some animals are persons. And I was dis uh, discussing that issue, and he also wrote a book called Animal Liberation, which really started what has uh, become the animal rights movement, although Peter Singer, as a utilitarian philosopher, is really not an animal rights activist. He doesn't believe in human rights, and he doesn't believe in animal rights. He, he's a utilitarian. And I was describing this to this class, and, and uh, I arguing that if we accept the idea that there are some human beings who have less value than other human beings, there's no ability fundamentally to support international human rights. And it would be such a setback after hundreds of years of striving to reach universal human rights and universal human equality to set back based on a different kind of invidious discrimination than we've done in the past would be tragic. And a young woman came up to me very earnest. You know how the young are. I remember being that young and that earnest. It's a long time ago. I know, I know. Uh, and she said, you're telling me that a human being has greater value than a bunny. And I was a bit taken aback, and I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, no, no, a bunny can feel pain. We're equal. And I thought, where did that come from? And that planted a seed, which resulted in a rat as a pig as a dog as a boy. Uh, I was on a show a few years later, and I write about this in the book, and the uh, talk show host gave me permission to do that. And I told the story I just mentioned. And the talk show host's eyes got very big, and she gasped, and she said, oh my gosh, yesterday my son came home to announce that the family dog is equal with the rest of us. And so there is something being sold to young people today in particular, and the animal rights movement uh, particularly targets young people. And I think there's some reasons for that we might want to get into later during the question and answer sessions. But that planted the idea of the book, because I've been, as, as people who know me, 
uh, pretty obsessed uh, in the last five to ten years with human exceptionalism, the idea that being human matters simply because we're human. The idea of universal human equality, the sanctity and equality of human life, the rights that are exclusively human in my view, and the concomitant duties that are also exclusively human. And <clears throat> this particular issue of animal rights fell right into that sweet spot, if you will, of my advocacy. And I realized that uh, as I was working in bioethics and as I was working uh, against assisted suicide and, and so forth, that this was all part of a bigger picture. These are not discrete issues, but they challenge very fundamentally what it means to be human and indeed whether being human is even relevant anymore. Because there are a lot of movements that think that being human is an irrelevant moral category. And one of them is the animal rights movement. And so I uh, got into this issue. And after several years, and that also is the issue that introduced me to the Discovery Institute, and they brought me on and they supported the work. And uh, as a consequence, this book has come out. And again, that couldn't have happened without the Discovery Institute. Uh, let me describe just a little bit of what my purpose is and my thinking in this field in terms of the importance of animals. It is not my purpose in this book to act as a defender of animal industries. Rather, my goal is primarily to expose the anti-human ideology of the animal rights liberation movement, expose its many deceptions, and warn against its sometimes violent tactics. I will also defend the use of animals as necessary and appropriate to promote human welfare, prosperity, and happiness. Finally, I will mount an unequivocal defense of the belief that human beings stand uniquely at the pinnacle of moral worth, a concept sometimes called human exceptionalism. I'm very well aware that these positions, once almost universally accepted, have become controversial in recent years. Few issues generate such intense emotionalism or fervent support by their adherents, as does animal rights. Thus, I want to make it very clear at the outset, as I will throughout the book, that I love animals, and like most people, I wince when I see them in pain. Moreover, I believe strongly that we as enlightened people have a profound moral and ethical obligation to treat animals humanely and respectfully, a core obligation of human exceptionalism, and by all means, never to cause them to suffer for frivolous reasons. I also strongly support laws against cruelty to animals, and I favor strengthening them when appropriate. In fact, I believe that animal abuse is a terrible wrong, not only because it causes the victimized animal to suffer, but also because cruelty to animals diminishes our own humanity. Now consider why I felt it necessary to make such an unusual disclaimer. Over the past 30 years, the concept of animal rights has seeped into the bone marrow of Western culture. Part of the reason is that animal rights is used so loosely, the term animal rights is used so loosely. It is often taken to mean little more than being nicer to animals. But this isn't true. Although animal rights groups do sometimes engage in animal welfare type activism, the term animal rights actually denotes a belief system, an ideology, even a quasi-religion, which both implicitly and explicitly seeks to create a moral equivalence between the value of human lives and those of animals. In fact, look at the title, A Rat is a Pig is a Dog is a Boy. I didn't coin that title, I stole it. I stole it from Ingrid Newkirk who is the leader of the ethical treatment for uh, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA, uh, which is probably the world's most famous animal rights group. And she has said this over many occasions, but I think this is the, uh, the best term, the best example, which illustrates, I think, quite vividly the moral equivalency that an the true animal rights activist, not somebody who believes in animal welfare, a lot of people are animal welfare activists who want us to be kinder to animals and more humane to animal, animals. They think they believe in animal rights. They don't. They believe in animal welfare. That term animal rights, as I mentioned, is used so loosely today, it can mean anything from uh, stopping Michael Vick from torturing dogs to uh, perhaps uh, preventing uh, labs uh, through violent intimidation uh, from engaging in necessary medical research. Anyway, back in 1989, Ingrid Newkirk said this, and it's very clear what she means. Animal liberationists do not separate out the human animal, so there is no rational basis for saying that human beings have special rights. 
A rat is a pig is a dog is a boy.